The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Close quarters and tough restrictions have, it seems, made tighter an already tight housing market in the province. Is the old not-in-my-backyard problem making it worse? Tonight, we're looking into that. First up, we'll check in with York Region's top doctor, Kareem Kurji, on why he's not a fan of lockdowns, even as COVID-19 variants gain traction in Ontario. It's Monday, March 15th, and that's next on The Agenda. Last month, Ontario lifted its second state of emergency. At the urging of some local mayors and the top public health official, York Region moved from lockdown to the red zone. Conversely, public health in neighboring Peel Region and Toronto asked that their areas remain in lockdown for two weeks longer than that. With rising concern about variants and a third wave, how are things going in York so far? Well, let's find out. In Markham, Ontario, from Dr. Kareem Kurji, who is the Medical Officer of Health for the Regional Municipality of York. And Dr. Kurji, it's good of you to join us tonight. How are you doing so far? Oh, very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, for having me on. Not at all. So let's, let's just, I'm going to just put some uh, uh, background information up first, and uh, then we'll get into the interview. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up, because we want to talk about this region of the province of Ontario, just north of the 416. There are about 1.2 million people living in nine cities and towns across York Region. More than half of them live in the two cities of Markham and Vaughan. And some of those towns in the region are less than a tenth of the size of those cities, such as King and East Willembury, which have about 28,000 and 34,000 people apiece. I suppose it makes sense, if we would, just to start with, um, why don't you give us a presentation uh, with a bunch of charts that you've brought in, and you can sort of take us through your thinking as to why York has, I guess, approached this issue somewhat differently from some of its neighboring jurisdictions. Shall we do that? So, Steve, if it's okay, maybe I'll just uh, give you a quick narrative first and then maybe take you through the charts, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, you know, we are at the stage now when it is possible that the uh, province uh, might decide to pull emergency brakes, uh, given the fact that they have seemed to have signaled that in the modeling presentations. So, I want to remind you that, uh, you know, I... I learned my epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene, where we had a fantastic instructor, the late Sir Geoffrey Rose. And one of the things that he said was epidemiology should be used to get to the truth. So when we look at the truth within your region statistics, what we find is that maybe a lockdown was justifiable at the start of the pandemic, when we knew no better. However, as we progress through the pandemic, we learned so much about the virus that we need to have targeted interventions. So, for example, right now in York Region, if you pull the emergency brake, it's not connected to the right wheels. We are not seeing outbreaks in malls. We are not seeing outbreaks in retail establishments. We are not seeing outbreaks in restaurants. We're seeing a few issues in gyms, which we are correcting. What we are seeing instead are folks who are unvaccinated staff who come into long-term care homes and they seem to be passing on the infection to other unvaccinated staff. And from there, it gets into the adults in schools. That's one example. Another example that we may be seeing are infectious individuals in one family, a large family, who never told us that they had close contacts in the form of midwives. And they didn't tell the midwives that they were infected. So these are examples where you then get, say, a newborn being infected plus another individual getting infected. These are individuals that, these are situations that require targeted interventions. And indeed, we have been applying those. Now, I also need to mention that lockdowns have tremendous mental health consequences as well. We know that substance abuse is increasing. We know that, like I've had a, a, a single father with three young children, appealed to me not to close down his business, given the fact that he'd taken to alcohol. 
we know that the chief coroner had said that there had been a 25% increase between March and May of substance abuse disorders. We know that eating disorders also tend to go up and they are associated with mortality. We know that people with autism spectrum disorders have a tough time dealing with these lockdowns. We do know that there are other social isolation issues, depression, anxiety issues, and suicides as well. When it, when it actually comes to these mental health issues, we know that there are institutions in society, and these are places of worship, that have been literally closed down. They are the fabric of society. They keep many of these problems at bay by providing social support. We mustn't lose sight of all these issues. We have to look at the community as a whole. Okay, now, why don't you if, you, if you would at this point, doctor, take us through your chart. Sure, please. certainly. So the first, first chart uh, refers to the deaths in York region. What I want you to look at is the right-hand side of this chart. The truth here, if I could get to the truth, is I'm not seeing a problem here. So why should we be going into a lockdown? Maybe we can move over to the second chart now. The second chart is the hospitalizations in York region. And the color at the top refers to the ICU cases. Again, you're seeing the hospitalizations of York region residents going down. Again, I'm not actually seeing a problem. So why should we be going into a lockdown? The next chart, please. Much has been made of a rising positivity rate in New York region. Look at the 4% there. When you actually look at the whole picture, I don't see a problem. So the truth here is, again, a lockdown is not needed. Let's look at the last chart here. And this chart is a very interesting chart because the blue lines tell us the total classic COVID cases and the yellow bars tell us the variance of concern. Now, this is the area that we need to pay close attention to. We in York region believe in very extensive and excellent case and close contact management as a means of keeping those variants at bay. And we believe that we've been succeeding at keeping them down. Slowly and steadily, they'll become the dominant form at the moment, they are about 40% of the normal. Slowly and steadily, they will become the dominant form. However, what we hope is that we'll be able to get to vaccinating people before they actually become the dominant form. The vaccinations is an interesting area as well. We in New York region went out earlier with respect to a vaccination of the general population. And we have already vaccinated about 63% of those over the age of 80. And you will remember in the beginning, uh, lockdowns were justified because we wanted to keep the most vulnerable safe and we wanted to keep the health capacity under control. But we feel that we've now got both of these things well established. And so the provincial parameters for the framework ought to be changed to actually allow us greater flexibility. I okay, think with I all of that, let me jump in here, because with all of that background yeah. in place, you do raise a host of questions, and I want to get to some of those right now. Essentially, your charts, we've got people listening on podcasts who couldn't see the charts, so I'll just sum up by saying, essentially, you've shown four charts which show the numbers coming down and which show things in York Region more under control than they surely were a few months ago. Having said that, you know, if you look at the, at the rate of infection per 100,000, which is, I gather, how epidemiologists measure this thing, the rates in York region are still actually higher than in Toronto and Peel. That's what I'm told. And yet Toronto and Peel are being stricter about opening up, whereas you're urging more opening up. And some people are wondering why. You want to tackle that one? Yes, certainly. So you see, this provincial framework has got moving uh, posts, as it were. Uh, just before November 13th, uh, the incidence that was allowable for us to go and remain in the lockdown, in the red zone, was 100 per 100,000. And uh, 
the positivity rate was up to 10%. You're now seeing that the framework has been changed to say, well, if you're over 40 per 100,000, you should probably be in a lockdown area. And if you've got positivity rates that are much lower, like I think over 2.5%, you should actually be in lockdown more. So the reality is that we already vaccinated a good chunk of our most vulnerable folks. So we're not going to be causing as much damage in terms of mortality. And as we get into the other age groups, the 75 to 80 age groups, that reduction in mortality will continue. We know that we've already vaccinated the long-term care homes, retirement homes, congregate living places, and uh, just getting into the home care clients. So I think the parameters have to be changed. And the fact that if you look at the curves for Toronto, Peel, and York region, it doesn't seem to matter what zone you are in. We all seem to be following the same pattern. If you look at the mobility patterns, which we've most recently looked at, the mobility curves for York region are very similar to those of Toronto and Peel. Well, so, let me jump in on that if I can, because, um, you know, the, the Premier has often admonished people, if you're living in Toronto or Peel, you're locked down, and we don't want you to be driving over to Durham or over to York to get your hair cut or go to a restaurant just because they're allowed to be open. How much of that mobility, in your view, is happening? Well, I imagine that human behavior, what it is, and people are tired of all these restrictions, that you're not going to get the same degree of compliance. The same thing happens when you're treating an individual patient, you give them medications, you don't get the same degree of compliance. So what we have done in York region is to ensure that our businesses keep everybody safe. So we have to have physical distancing rules, all the other rules that you know are supposed to keep them safe. They were implemented as a Section 22 order initially, and then when the province caught up with respect to those restrictions, we took away the Section 22 order. And we have tremendous enforcement that is carrying on. We have a COVID-19 enforcement task force that just in the last week has inspected some 2,500 premises, has given some 500 educational encounters and some 50 charges. From November 22nd onwards, they've inspected something like 25,000 premises. So we're making sure that our businesses remain in compliance. Okay, how about this angle? York Region, I guess unlike the City of Toronto, is, is very diverse in terms of what it offers for population density, right? Toronto's pretty dense in population. York Region has some cities that have dense population, but some exurban and, and uh, rural areas uh, where it's much more sparsely populated. How do you come up with an approach to tackling COVID-19 in such a disparate area? You're quite right um, in saying that York Region is a very diverse community. In fact, it is three times the size of Toronto and with a population of 1.2 million, it is bigger than five provinces in Canada. However, at the onset, our Chairman of Regional Council, Wayne Emerson, had called a meeting of all the mayors and myself, and we had debated this issue as to whether we were gonna be splitting up York Region into targeted areas, or whether we were gonna be going as a whole. And the consensus was that we were gonna be moving together from one zone to another. And that actually helps us in public health because we honestly don't have the resources to be able to have different messages for one area and, another, and a different message for another area. And there was concern that people would in any case move from one area to another area. So you're quite right. You know, the incidences do tend to vary. Uh, places like Vaughan, Markham and Richmond Hill tend to have the bulk of the cases. But occasionally when we look at the incidence rates, we actually find that there isn't that much of a difference. Uh, and sometimes the northern municipalities are suffering just as badly. Hmm. Dr. Kurji, let me ask you this. You know, there are, there are some people in the 416 who think that the capital city ought to open up a lot more. Um, for example, Roman Babber, who's a member of the Ontario legislature who got kicked out of the Ontario PC caucus, the governing caucus, because he shared some of the same views you did in as much as he's worried about mental health issues and he's worried about the effects of locking down too much for too long. You've become a bit of a champion, I gather, for that group. How do you feel about that? 
Well, I think I would differ from uh, the MPP in certain ways. Um, I believe that we as a society have to move together and we have to respect the rule of law. Uh, there are decisions that are made that I don't necessarily agree with, but then I have to respect that. I think we can put forward our discussions, but the society that we live in has to dissect these points of views and come up with uh, recommendations. And ultimately, it would have to be the premier. And I believe the premier kind of refers to the local MOH and the chief medical officer of health discussions. So we have a process in place. So I would defer from the MPP in that I would rather be law abiding. There are people who think that you ought to have your eye strictly on the public health ball. And they worry that your eye is also on the economic ball, that you're equally as concerned about the state of the economy in York Region as opposed to just public health. If that's a charge, how do you plead guilty to that? How do you plead to that charge? I make no apology for that at all, because the speciality that we are in used to be called social medicine, and then it translated into community medicine, and is now called public health here. In the UK, it's called public health medicine. And if you go back to the roots, we in this particular field have been the champions of health in terms of all the determinants that contribute to health. In this case, income is a very important determinant of health. And those that avoid that consideration are being not quite truthful with respect to the contributors to health. So I make no such apology at all. Is your approach in York Region, do you think, appropriate for every other region in the province? Unfortunately, I don't have access to the data sets for each and every area. And uh, the way we practice public health in Ontario is we leave it to the local medical office of health to be making the best decisions. Um, but I mean, I've taken you through some of the decision making processes that we have used and we use data as the guiding principle. Yes, the variants of concern are of concern, but we don't think that there will be any explosive growth. And even if there is, we don't think that the emergency break is going to be stopping that. Our best bet is to go through the vaccinations as fast as possible, get to the variants of concerns, which are mainly being transmitted amongst the younger people, ages 40 to 55 and even younger. And we've got to get to vaccinating them as fast as possible. And I think the province has got this right. First, attack those individuals who are most likely to die and then get into the, those that are likely to be transmitting disease. Okay, just let's finish up on this then. When, you know, it's been a frequent situation that uh, Dr. Staney Brown, for example, and other public health officials, they have briefings for the premier, they have briefings for the members of the public, they're televised, and, and frequently they bring out charts which are not like yours at all. Your charts go down like this. Their charts go like this, as in if we don't do what, what, what Staney Brown and company say, our rates are going to go up to the heavens. When you see those prognostications, what goes through your mind? Again, I bring you back to what Sir Jeffrey Rose had said. Um, epidemiology is a means of getting to the truth. Modeling, in my mind, is really a tool. And it's something that tells us what might happen if we didn't bring in the right interventions. In York Region, we have excellent case and contact follow-up. That's a huge intervention, specific targeted interventions, and we keep on thinking of new specifically targeted interventions so that we don't actually end up with those sorts of projections. However, I would not wish to dictate how I manage an epidemic with just models. Models are just one tool that are available. Gotcha. Dr. Kareem Kurji from York Region, it's awfully good of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Steve. Take care. As real estate observers debate a possible housing bubble in Canada's largest urban area, people already in search of a home say that the pre-pandemic affordability crisis has only gotten worse. But if the problem has been recognized for some time already, why hasn't supply increased enough to stabilize prices? 
With us now on what part neighborhoods and zoning play in this story, we welcome from her office at City Hall in the heart of Ontario's capital, Paula Fletcher, City Councillor for Toronto Danforth. In the Kingsview Village neighborhood, Cheryl Case, founder and principal urban planner at CP Planning and co-editor of House Divided, How the Missing Middle Will Solve Toronto's Housing Crisis. In Seton Village, also a co-editor of House Divided, there's Alex Bozikovic, architecture critic for the Globe and Mail. And in the Humewood area of the city, Joe Mahavik, who was a councillor in Toronto from 1991 to 2018 and is now a visiting professor at York University. And it's great to welcome you four onto TVO tonight. Uh, let me start with uh, the one of us who... Uh, is elected, and then we'll go to the one of us who was elected for uh, the first shots at this question. There's a lot of outrage in uh, Toronto, I guess a, a couple of weeks ago, about some opposition to an affordable housing project that was going to take place in a parking lot that one resident described as the hub and the heart of the community. Um, okay, let's find out. How common has this type of objection been? Councillor Fletcher, you first, in your experience. This is uh, quite common. This was a modular housing site, supportive housing for men coming off the street, have been homeless and looking for a solid place to live with great supports. Uh, I think change is always hard, but I know from my experience that while there's people that are opposed, there are always a lot of people, institutions, churches, schools, many other community leaders that are in favor. As a matter of fact, on Queen Street, when Wood Green built First Steps to Homes, which was in a former hotel, and uh, they had someone go in the community to talk about how important it is to house these folks, there was a housewarming party, and the neighbors all delivered toaster ovens, sheets, silverware, many things for these men moving into a stable housing situation. So I think sometimes it's how you go about it, Steve. Joe Mahavik, can I get you to weigh in on, on this uh, issue as well? But from this standpoint... Um, do we have these kinds of issues only when you're trying to house, say, a difficult-to-house cohort? Or do you get this kind of stuff regardless? Oh, you almost get it regardless. And as uh, uh, Paula Fletcher was just uh, saying, change is hard for some people, and it gets articulated in sometimes uh, very unhealthy ways. Uh, in all my days, and this goes back to the early 90s, I cannot remember a case where there hasn't been some kind of community opposition to either an affordable housing project or a social housing project or a shelter going in. Having said that, at the same time, there has not been, I'm pretty sure, 99.9% .9 sure, that I've never seen a case where city council or staff have backed off and said, okay, we will follow the advice or the nimbyism that is presenting itself and going go in a different direction. We have always, under Lastman, under Miller, under Ford, under Tory, the affordable housing, social housing, shelter project has always won at the end of the day. But You're there is a process, and some processes are healthier, and some processes are not so healthy in, uh, in attaining community acceptance. Yeah, you mentioned NIMBYism, and just for those who don't follow this stuff all that carefully, NIMBY, not in my backyard. That is the reference to what we're talking about here. Uh, Cheryl Case, let me get you in here. I, I think most people would understand that if you want it in a, you know, in a rel relatively not dense neighborhood, if, if somebody wanted to put up a 50-story condo in the middle of a, a neighborhood full of bungalows, okay, we get that. We understand what the neighborhood opposition to that would be. But setting that aside, how difficult is it, in your experience, to even see gentle density, duplexes, triplexes, four-story buildings put up in neighborhoods? Um, well, it's actually quite incredibly difficult, and it's a funny thing that it, is, it that it is so difficult because you're seeing actually a lot of change happening in these single-family neighborhoods. Um, you know, in my neighborhood here in Kinsey Village, every time I go on a walk, I see a new bungalow that's been torn down and in process to being built into a two-story, um, you know, huge, huge home, right? Like the type of home that you would only dream to to live in and uh, have an excess of space living in. Um, where these types of housing are permitted to be, you know, redeveloped into um, two-story single-family houses, you can't take that same bungalow and turn it into a multifamily housing um, opportunity. And, you know, the reason for that is really ingrained into our planning culture in uh, Ontario. 
Tell me what you mean by that. The planning culture refers to what? Um, so the planning culture, you know, I think to go, to go first, I'll say that, you know, the average person consulted in a planning consultation is a homeowner, right? They're the ones who are being consulted around planning. And actually, um, as we've been developing a planning practice for the last 100 years, it's been the homeowner who's been giving given the priority. So to give you an example of how this has uh, played out in our history, in the 40s and 60s is when, um, is when a lot of the suburban neighborhoods in Toronto were established and a lot of the very restrictive zoning regulations were established as well. And so I'll tell you a story about Thorncrest in, in, uh, here in Etobicoke. If you think about it, it's, um, it's in the Eglinton and Rathburn area here. And so as this neighborhood was being um, established and being built out, it was being built solely for single family housing. And that was its selling point. And uh, in this neighborhood, you actually had to apply to buy, to purchase housing. And you look into the things that people were writing as they were applying to buy the housing there, they were writing in, my neighborhood is being, um, you know, a lot of immigrants are moving into my neighborhood. A lot of working class people are moving into my neighborhood. And they essentially were trying to escape that type of social mixing. Um, and that's that's the foundation of our planning. The planning process enabled that type of social and, and class segregation um, and has essentially allowed that to be ingrained into a, the minds of these community members that this is their entitlement. It's their entitlement to live separate from lower income people. Hmm. Okay, understood. Let's, uh, Sheldon, would you mind bringing up this graphic here, top of page two? And Alex, I'll give you the first kick at this one, and then I want to hear Councillor Fletcher on as well, because it's actually her neck of the woods we're talking about. This is from a tweet. It references population change from 1971 to 2016. For the census tracts immediately north and south of Danforth between Broadview and Victoria Park. And we see... I guess for people who are listening on podcast, I'll just describe this a little bit. The red shaded areas on the western end and the gray shaded areas on the eastern end of that area that we're looking at. The population of Toronto grew three times in that time span, 71 to 2016. And that area on the Danforth has some of the highest so-called walk scores, transit scores, and cycling scores. And then when the relief subway line is built, well, some of it under, some of it over, I guess, I call it the relief line, it'll serve as part of that area too. There's not many parts of this city that are more connected than that. Alex, how did all that happen? Well, the trend that we see there is one that's happened across Toronto, it's happened across Vancouver, it's happened across basically every major city in North America over the last 50 years. We, our demographics have changed and the way in which we live has changed. You know, when you think about the families of our parents and grandparents' generation, they tended to have more kids. It was very common for those who owned homes to have tenants or boarders in their houses. And in Toronto, and particularly in the neighborhoods around downtown, those neighborhoods were less wealthy, and a lot of the buildings that are houses now were divided up into apartments. So you put all that stuff together, and a single building that a generation ago might have housed six or even eight or even ten people might very well house three or four right now. So even while we see some new housing being built, you know, the occasional condo here and there, although not on the Danforth, um, the the, gener the shrinkage in household size and the fact that each of us is taking up more space means that the buildings we have just don't hold as many people. Councillor Fletcher, can I get you to speak to the angle on this that, that we see a part of the city here that, that does... I mean, obviously, you represent this part of the city, so I know you're going to say it's fantastic. And it is in so many ways, right? Good, good public transit, cycling ability. Uh, as a general rule, you don't get the kind of uh, traffic that races through. You know, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty nice and walkable, that area as well. But, but you don't exactly see an intensification of living space there. How come? Well... A couple of things I found that interesting about this, Steve, and I had a constituent call me who'd put out of the coal programs in at different churches, and she said, oh, Paul, in our neighborhood, uh, these homes that were multi-tenanted are all being turned over now for single families, and I think that's happening somewhat in this neighborhood as well as in Parkdale. Also, uh, what I find interesting is that densification is taking place much more on the streetcar line down on Queen Street than on the subway line on the Danforth. It's one of the reasons why we're doing a planning study for the Danforth between Coxwell and Broadview. It's underway now. And one was done between um, uh, Coxwell and Victoria Park. 
which has identified a number of sites for intensification. I think that there's a, the Danforth is just missing the densification around the station. So as you mentioned, Steve, with the relief line, Pape Station will have to be densified. There's some major station transit assessments are being done for all of those stations. And the other thing I find interesting is that owners on the Danforth just are not that interested in selling and building up um, and you can't force somebody to do that so with the planning study we're just going to talk about what's possible what we can make how high you can go what do we want but i've also added into that planning study something that doesn't go into planning studies very often and that is affordability has to get baked into any permissions that we can have on the Danforth. All right, but having said all that, Alex, uh, does does the plan for that area, I mean, if even if you wanted to put up, let's say, uh, a 10-story condo uh, right near a subway station, the zoning does not allow that, I don't think, does it? Well, this is the tricky thing. Um, there's always, uh, there are always complexities to this sort of thing. Planning and zoning, the sort of specific regulations for each site are always complicated and they're complicated in ways that make it hard to build apartment buildings without exception. So the city of Toronto in this particular stretch of Danforth Avenue it has called it what it calls an avenue. So it's a commercial street. And the city has decided that new buildings of some size are allowed to go on the Danforth on this street itself, but they're not allowed to go on any of the streets adjacent to it. So, and not only is that the case, that all of the growth is limited to one particular street, but by the time you get to a building that's 10 or 12 stories tall, it starts to cast shadows on the buildings behind it. And those are houses and that's forbidden buildings start to have what's called overlook. So someone from the upper stories can look down on the house neighborhood behind it. And that also is forbidden. You know, long story short, the regulations that would allow you to build apartment buildings in this on top of a subway station make it very, very difficult once you get into the details. And the city is not doing a meaningful job of changing that. In fact, this new plan that Council Fletcher is talking about is going to continue that status quo to make it very, very difficult to build buildings of any size here. Okay, Joe, let's continue the story this way then. We see a part of the city which is very livable, a very desirable neighborhood, uh, very little density. Many people believe it could take a lot more intensification given the amount of transit and, and how nice the lifestyle is there. And yet you go to some other parts of the capital city, maybe up by York University. Maybe it, uh, if you go east to Scarborough, not nearly as much public transit in those locations, not walkable at all. Uh, cars flying by at great speeds, so not necessarily a safe place to cycle either. And there is tremendous growth, and zoning allows for tremendous growth. Can you explain all that to us? Well, in, in, in the suburbs, what you're seeing is uh, the, new, the new immigrants are moving to the suburbs. And so what we saw downtown and in the old East York and York, and, you know, my family is a great example of what, uh, what Alex was speaking about, parents, five kids, and then we rented the basement, and then my cousin moved in. And, you know, it was actually a pretty good way of living. Uh, we learned pluralism. We learned how to respect one another. We learned how to share. There's a whole bunch of social skills that you learn when you live like the majority of the rest of the world lives, and that is an extended and uh, different matrices of a uh, of family. Um, those families uh, are here in Toronto. Um, extended families, but they're in the suburbs, and they are buying up those those, uh, those bungalows. Some of those uh, neighborhood, single-family neighborhood uh, areas, that's where the new immigrants that are in a position to buy, uh, that are getting money from aunt and uncle and this and a variety of people, and they're moving in, and they're moving in in groups of 10, 15 people into, into those uh, areas. That's one reason why they're uh, they're uh, intensifying, and of course it's cheaper land, and it's a, a cheaper land because it's further away from uh, from work and it's further away from uh, from public transit. There are a number of uh, development applications also that are coming uh, along the major arteries near subway stations in those areas as well, and that's accounting for the increase in uh, in population in the Scarboroughs and the Rexdales and in the uh, Jane Finches of uh, of Toronto. Well, again, Cheryl, I'm going to ask you to explain something about why this makes sense. And, I mean, we're here at this studio at the corner of Young and Eglinton. There's an LR, $6 billion LRT going in here. We've had the Young Street subway line here for 70 years. I get why there's $2 billion worth of condo construction going on, you know, two steps outside the front door here at TVO. 
What I'm a little less clear about is they've had a subway line on Danforth uh, also for half a century, if not more, and yet we don't see any of these large construction projects going up, and we know there are lots of people who want to live there. Why isn't it happening? Uh, so that's something I'd have to look into the census data to tell you, if I'm honest, actually, because you know, what's the difference between Young and Eglinton and um, the Danforth? You know, Young and Eglinton has been known as uh, Young, Young and Single, or what was the Young term and for eligible. The, Young and eligible, right? So I'm curious what the demographics are there. Like, are there more renters at that intersection? Um, are the parcels of land larger? Um, are there is there are there more homeowners in uh, East York? I know that, for example, in the area where the uh, modular housing is going up, only about 20% of the neighborhood are is renters. So that shows it to be a bit of an indication to me that maybe there is more homeownership going on in that area. That's I think something that maybe Paula Fletcher would be able to answer to more than uh, I would. Yeah, good idea. Paula, can you tell us whether or not, um, could you build a 50-story condo somewhere uh, near the Pape subway or the Chester subway on Danforth? Well, we're looking at that right now. I just want to say that at Broadview, there's a fair amount of density. At Maine and Danforth, there's a fair amount of density. And at um, Greenwood, we've got density. At Woodbine, there's an application in for, I think it's about a 31-story condo. So it's coming, and the density will be greater than on the streetcar lines. But in our Danforth study, um, and I do say I have a nine-story condo going on at Greenwood and, and, and Danforth, Alex, which uh, was a large site, as Cheryl's talked about having a site big enough. That was a beer store. So a lot of the beer stores are now turning over into, into developments. But in our Danforth study, there's a very interesting piece that I think contributes to the missing middle, which is at, you know, there's the the zone where all the parking lots are over top of the subway line and is to have some gentle density coming onto those on onto those parking lots in behind the houses from the laneways. And I think it's pretty exciting. We're out there talking about it now. So there's many types of density to be added. And I think the missing middle is really incredibly important. And that's why we have the pilot going on right now in Ward 19 to look at how to do that particularly soft, gentle density that people really shouldn't be opposed to, although I'm finding they are opposed to even soft and gentle density. Well, opposition, let's talk about that for a second, because that raises the issue of the quote-unquote character of a neighborhood. And Alex, you wrote about this in The Globe, and I'm going to read an excerpt from your piece, and then we'll come back and chat. This idea of character is both toxic and vague. It was born a century ago out of naked prejudice against racialized people, renters, and any household arrangement that didn't include husband, wife, and children. Somehow this legacy is still with us. Brought along by the planning profession during the post-war era, it has shaped the attitudes and expectations of people, especially homeowners, for two generations now. Alex, just expand on that a bit, if you would, the character of a neighborhood and how that can some, sometimes be awfully nefarious. So character is one of these planning jargon words that is very loosely defined and very subjective. But basically what it means is that you can't put a new building in a place that doesn't look more or less like the buildings that we already have. And again, you know, as, as you suggested in the quote that you read, that has roots in ideas 100 years old, that apartments are somehow not appropriate places for families, or that the right kind of people or the right kind of citizen you know, will live in a house. Um, I don't think there are many people either in the planning profession or at City Hall anywhere who would agree with that today. And yet the basic thrust of what we have here still shows up in Toronto as it does in other places. The character of the house neighborhoods along the Danforth is seen as sacred. You can't, you know, buy three houses along the Danforth, combine them and put up an apartment building, which is exactly what happened in neighborhoods such as the Annex in Toronto half a century ago and made those neighborhoods, you know, more... Uh, less economically segregated, more heavily populated, you know, more diverse than they are today. Because that idea of character, you know, which locks the neighborhood down, is applied to house neighborhoods and it's applied unequally. It's uh, It winds up being a tool for people who have the most political power to say no. Cheryl, when you hear the expression, the character of the neighborhood, what kind of a bell does that ring for you? I just want to first like give like Alex like like some snaps for for that quote. 
Like, I think we need to have uh, more white people also in, in places of privilege um, and with a, with a voice to, to, to say these things, to say these things, because these are this is a fact. There are receipts. There is evidence that this is the root of um, the way that planning is done. And it is, unfortunately, the way it's still being done today. Um, and so when I hear, you know, that this term of character being an excuse for not progressing towards a planning culture that actually is able to meet the housing needs of um, our residents, you know, I say, OK, whatever, I'm going to go and work with people who are actually focused on providing affordable housing to um, all their community members. And, and that includes there are many homeowners um, who are invested in the well-being of their neighbors and other uh, lower income neighbors as well, um, as Paula Fletcher has mentioned. Right. Like there are many people who are not um, given a center stage to talk about these things. Um, and so that's what I really focus in on in my work is working with those people who are looking to build the future that we need and that we deserve. Joe, let's take, though, the most benign interpretation of the word character of the neighborhood. And let's, and let's understand what your job when you were a city councillor, what it was. In some respects, you are there to represent the aspirations and interests of the people who already live in your ward, while at the same time understanding that more people want to move into your ward and need places to live. And in some respects, I mean, they don't live there yet, so you don't necessarily represent their interests yet. How do you, as a councillor, balance those competing interests? Well, you, you do have to take people through a, a process, and that's a good, good politics is good community development work. And it starts early, and it starts with lots of conversation, um, and it starts with bringing together people that need to speak with one another. So people who are perhaps uh, against, the, against the proposed development, people who are for the development, people, young people, older people. You have to reach out to make sure that there's that the table that you're part of um, includes voices that often aren't heard. And it is. it has been my experience, um, and I, I would certainly uh, push this as well uh, to any uh, new counselor, uh, is just to engage that process. And usually when you engage the process, you don't overcome all of the opposition, but you do bring people along and you help them to understand the kinds of pressures and, and desires and visions that you can you can have in a neighborhood. Like at the end of the day, what we want to do is create healthy, vibrant, diverse, diverse being a key word, a neighborhood. And that's also part of the official plan, that we don't have all the rich people here and all the poor people there, but that e that each neighborhood has the has the variety of the stuff of what makes urban uh, areas uh, uh, vital. Um, and if you think through that process with communities, um, usually they find that they land, not everybody, there's always going to be a little opposition, and that's where you have to have political courage to just say, we're not going, we're not going to let the status quo be. Uh, usually people will come along and see the, the better wisdom in having this diversity. Well, Councillor Fletcher, let me get you on that, because uh, on the one hand, you've got to represent the people who voted for you and who live there now. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who want to live on the Danforth, and, and they want you to represent them as well. How do you handle that? I think a lot of people that live around the Danforth really want some density on the Danforth. They always say, why, don't, why does Queen Street have all that density and uh, going up? And why does it look European and feel European and the Danforth feels like it's not? It's from a different era, just of two stories. So um, I do think that there's a real willingness. I do find that the owners on the Danforth aren't as willing to put those properties up. And there's not as many large sites. And Cheryl really hit the nail on the head there in having a large enough site to get enough density. So... Um, I'll just go, Alex knows well about Don Somerville's site. It was a site I took on when we had the changes in the boundary. And it was coming to me with 120 rent gear due income and about 600 condos. I felt that that was not a good enough mix and sent everybody back. They were very angry at me uh, to go back and add in 100 new affordable units, 125 rental, because not everybody can afford to buy, put under the rental under co-op and replace the Toronto community housing sites. So we have to have an approach that says every time we're doing something, we want to have as much diversity in people, in incomes, 
And our planning regimen, Alex is right, it doesn't speak to that at the moment. I think that's what Joe's talking about, the courage to say, when we're going to redo something, we're going to redo this so it meets everybody's needs. Toronto Community Housing has huge sites. Lawrence Sites is 100 acres. Regent Park, 69 acres. How much new affordable has been added in there? Not enough. So I come from the point of view that if we're going to do something, let's have something socially important take place as well. I think the Danforth's ready for that. I think people on the Danforth are ready. And the planning study, I hope, will be a catalyst to getting that going uh, west of Coxwell. Well, Alex, maybe you can help us figure this out. There, there are people, who, obviously, who live in these neighbourhoods for a relatively short space of time. Maybe they live there two years, five years, ten years, in neighbourhoods that have been there for a century. Why do they get such an outsized say for what's going to happen in these neighbourhoods going ad infinitum into the future? Well, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. They vote. Um, <laughs> they are people who vote for people like Councillor Fletcher. And potential tenants who are going to move into the neighbourhood do not vote. Um, you know, so that's one very basic fact. And the neighbourhoods where that have political pull are the neighbourhoods that get to push back on new growth. You know, the other thing that's important to understand is that it's not a given that we have this, a system like we would do today, where every new building has to jump through hoops for years and where neighbors effectively have veto power over every new development that happens in the city. I mean, if you go back half a century in Toronto, the apartment buildings that now ho house close to half of the city, a lot of those were built by buying a group of houses, tearing them down and building a new building that houses 100 times more people. You know, my immigrant grandparents got evicted from their house on Marley Road in the late 60s for a new apartment building that now houses, you know, at least seven or 800 people. You know, that idea of displacing people is not necessarily great, but where we see that happening, that kind of change, the big change where houses get replaced by apartment buildings, it's only happening in neighborhoods that are marginalized. It is not happening in the house neighborhoods in places like the Danforth or in house neighborhoods like my own. Well, Cheryl, we're asking this question, of course, because uh, if you look at the population expectation numbers over the next, say, decade and a half or so, two and a half decades, well, let's hear. I've got the number here. By the year 2046, if we take the kind of population increases that the greater Toronto area has been seeing, we're going to have a population in this area of nearly 10 million people. That is enormous. And my question is, can we, given the given the way we currently plan cities, given the kind of density people seem to be comfortable with at the moment, which is to say not all that much in some places, can we actually accommodate that kind of growth without paving over the green belt, without taking over other agricultural land in the area, without changing the quote unquote character of current neighborhoods? Can all that get done? Uh, I, I strongly do believe so, and, and that's why I'm actually very happy to be a part of um, the uh, housing lab with Jennifer Kizma and CMHC, where we're looking into just these types of problems, looking at building relationships between uh, members of community who at one point maybe opposed um, each other in terms of, you know, who's able to live in this neighbourhood, what types of housing is able to be built in this neighbourhood, and building these uh, community relationships and, and, ex and, and exploring where can we build housing that's not just about building in large sites, because frankly, we don't have enough large sites to uh, put all the affordable housing there. We need to be building missing middle housing, we need to be building housing across neighborhoods. And this is not just about affordable housing, this is about having uh, healthy neighborhoods, right? We talked about how some parts of these neighborhoods they're seeing their um, the population decline, they're seeing schools closing, and that's not really where we need to be going. And so um, I think this is something that, you know, to look forward to is around this, you know, this this lab and, and some of the, the results that we'll be putting forward in the next couple of months around uh, building relationships with members of community of all lived experiences, renters, homeowners, longtime residents, new immigrants, um, and, and really designing together our path forward. Joe, you want to follow so, on yes, that? I think it's possible. Yes, I, I, I do think that there's been a lot of progress in the last, uh, well, 30 years since uh, amalgamation, uh, especially around uh, identifying the corridors where there's good public transit, but that's a key area where we have to put a lot of density. And so uh, my, I think the trend line would be that opposition to particular buildings and major corridors, Bathurst and, Bathurst and Bloor is a good one, the old Honest Ed site, that wasn't a major, major 
fight the way it might have been maybe 20, 25 years ago. Where I think the the nub of the issue is, and that's why the book that Alex and uh, Cheryl edited is so important, where the fight is going to be in the next little while is precisely that gentle density. It's just to see in residential communities where the single family uh, home was idealized with mom and pop and 2.2 kids and a white picket fence that went to the suburbs and then came downtown, whether we're open as a city uh, to seeing that, you know what, triplexes belong here, fourplexes, sixplexes belong here, where you can have different types of, uh, of uh, urban forms in what before was not permitted. Now the conversation is maybe some of the density to allow that 10 million person growth to happen in this area is going to have to happen in these single family areas, which actually predominant the predominate the geography of the of uh, of the city of Toronto. Maybe that's a good housing form, and maybe it's also a good living form as well to reconnect and stop the individualization of us, the bachelor apartment. Um, that really doesn't put us in contact with one another enough, whereas the old form that predated World War II, uh, that many of us grew up with uh, if we came as, a, as new immigrants, to allow housing to facilitate that, those kinds of family, extended family forms, I think that's something that will be the big debate in the next little while. And I know council is having, city council in Toronto uh, has some reports coming forward that, uh, that will uh, challenge those, those paradigms and bring, the, bring us up into the gentle density uh, paradigm. Well, Councillor Fletcher, let me put a controversial idea on the table, which we know the sure. current provincial government likes a lot. MZ. <laughs> O's, Ministerial Zoning Orders. This is where, at the request of Council, most of the time, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs simply overrides whatever opposition there may be to increasing density in an area and says, it's going to happen. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy around that. I know there are a lot of people who don't like Steve Clark, who's the Minister. They don't like his use of MZOs. But is that, in your view, a potential instrument to overcome NIMBYism? What's interesting is that the four sites for the modular housing are all being done through MZOs. The first two sites, one in Scarborough and one in Davenport, and then the next two, one in Willowdale and one in East York, Council just last month to ask the minister for an MZO in order for that to be done quickly in order to get people off the street. I will note that the Member of Parliament from Willowdale sent a letter saying, don't use the MZO for that supportive housing. In other words, wanting to people zone can't have a homeless moving into the neighborhood. So I think that we've stepped up in that way. I want to just talk about the pilot and how important the pilot is for the missing middle. And the pilot being that in Ward 19, looking at sites where that can be gentle density. There's one that went to the Committee of Adjustment and was actually turned down by the Committee of Adjustment. So we have to quickly get to a point where city policy says, we are looking for that gentle density. These things are okay to happen um, because I don't think we're there. So this pilot's coming back, uh, I think in, in April or May to hear how that's going along. And I've seen the decision of the committee and it's very odd. It's basically neighbors saying no. And that becomes the NIMBY issue. So to my mind, always going out and talking to people about why we need more housing, why it has to be diverse, why we need affordability, why we need to raise up the density in a gentle way is the way to win these things and find people that agree with us, find people that want to do that. I know I'm just going to go back to Don Somerville, which added a lot of density, but we went to the community first and had the conversation particularly about affordable housing. There's nobody in Toronto that doesn't talk about affordable housing. Mm. So I think missing middle is important. Uh, adding gentle density, more density, including affordability, are all things that are on our plate right now, including with the city's big housing now plan, which is very bold. And I think we're in a housing term at this council. It, 2018 to 2022, that's the term when city council turns its mind to housing of all kinds, increasing it, increasing the affordability, and increasing rentability, so it's not just condos, and making sure people have a place to live. And being bold and courageous. Alex, last 30 seconds to you on whether or not the Minister of Municipal Affairs should use MZOs 
to overturn the notion that only single-family dwellings can live within, I don't know, 500 meters of a subway station, let's say? Well, an MZO is, you know, a particular tool, and it can be used for good, and it can be used for evil. I think the better approach that the province should take is to push the city of Toronto, particularly, and also other municipalities, into updating their plan and updating their zoning, because the plan that we have now does not support the values that we claim to hold as a city. And that's true for other municipalities as well. We need to do a reset. We need to do get a new set of plans and a new set of bylaws in place that actually allow growth, allow it in a lot of places, allow it without a lot of jumping through hoops, and then we might actually achieve some of these uh, wonderful things that we all aspire to. Our thanks to Alex Bozikovic. Joe Mahavik, the former city councillor, Paula Fletcher, the current city councillor, and Cheryl Case, good of all four of you to join us on TVO for this discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great Thank you. And that is the agenda for this Monday, the Ides of March 2021. Yes, it was 2065 years since Julius Caesar was assassinated at the Senate House in Rome. As we approach a different anniversary this week, the one-year anniversary of Ontario's first pandemic state of emergency, beginning tomorrow across all of TVO's platforms, we're exploring this year of COVID. We'll have documentaries, articles online, and here on the agenda, we'll start by speaking to seniors and their families about what life has been like for older Ontarians inside and outside long-term care. Hope you'll join us for all of that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.